Hello, good afternoon, good morning, whatever you are, good evening. Uh, welcome to today's um, focus webinar and thank you for joining us um, again. Uh, my name is Daria and I will be your webinar host today. Uh, the webinar is now beginning, so all lines have been muted. Uh, please use the Q&A box for any questions or the chat box for comments you have throughout the webinar. Today's topic is Introduction to MSK Soft Tissue Ultrasound, and our speaker is Dr. Simone Rudnin. Dr. Rudnin uh, is an emergency medicine physician who completed her emergency medicine residency and ultrasound fellowship at Northwell Health Staten Island University Hospital. She remained as a faculty at the Staten Island University Hospital as the Director of Medical Student Education and the Co-Ultrasound Division Director for Emergency Medicine Ultrasound. Please welcome our speaker today, Dr. Simone Rutnin. Thank you so much for being with us today. We're very excited to hear your presentation. I'm so excited to um, give this presentation to everyone. Give me just a moment while I share my screen. Yes, All right, you're able to see my screen. Yes. Great. So today we're gonna be talking about soft tissue and MSK ultrasound. Anytime we do a soft tissue or MSK ultrasound, you have to uh, look at things in at least two views because what you might initially see is not actually there. And so when we look at things, we want to look at um, two views, both sagittal and in transverse planes. So soft tissue and MSK ultrasound has a lot of indications, right? We can look for cellulitis. We can look for abscesses. We can look for neck fash. Uh, we can assess lymph nodes. Are they enlarged or inflamed? form bodies. We can use it to diagnose fractures and dislocations, tendon ruptures, joint infusion, a lot of pediatrics, and we could um, help in conjunction look at airway stuff. So anytime we do a soft tissue or MSK ultrasound, we want to be using a linear probe because it's a high frequency and lower penetrance. So it gives you a higher resolution for something that's more superficial. So when we look at the soft tissue, the first layer that you'll see is the epidermis or dermis, followed by the hypodermis, and then tendons, which have this fine fibular structure, muscles, and fascia. So again, normal soft tissue, you'll initially see the epidermis and the dermis. You'll see subcutaneous tissue. You'll see the fascia layers and muscles. So let's start by looking at uh, cellulitis. Cellulitis is a clinical diagnosis, but ultrasound will help us um, help in diagnosing this pathology, right? On exam, patients will have erythema, warmth, tenderness, and swelling. But on ultrasound, what you'll see is this cobblestoning appearance of the fascia where it starts getting a little bit thicker and you lose that fine um, fascial layers and the you lose the echotexture of the actual epidermis. So when I look for patients who I presume might have cellulitis, I always start by looking at the normal. And then I start looking to see where their um, redness or erythema begins. And then you can start seeing the differentiation from the normal to the abnormal. And here you can see that it becomes a little bit more thicker. You start seeing more cobblestoning or a little bit of fluma, fluid and edema. So again, remember, you'll see a lot of cobblestoning when you have cellulitis. Abscesses are a localized collection of pus. Again, you can have erythema, warmth, tenderness, swelling, and fluctuance. This is an example of an abscess. Um, you can see that it's uh, hypoechoic and it has a little bit of debris. And here we're kind of pushing it a little bit and it has this somewhat of a squish sign. So abscesses can be fluctuant and you can squish them on ultrasound as well. This is another example of an abscess and you can measure to see how deep it is. So if you are draining at bedside, you can actually do a pre and a post. 
We a lot of times use the Massachusetts abscess rule, which is a clinical decision rule using ultrasound to identify MRSA. And really, your higher probability of patients having MRSA are lack of well-defined edges, smaller volume or, or irregular shaped and indistinctly shaped. Those are just kind of helpful tools to determine what antibiotics you want to prescribe if you're prescribing patients um, antibiotics after you've drained their abscess. Lymph nodes, on the other hand, <clears throat> should be distinguished between abscess formation because unlike abscesses, lymph nodes have this stalk-like blood flow appearance. They're superficial and they have this finite structure. So this is an example of a lymph node where you can actually see this hypoacolic region and a hyperacolic um, middle, which is kind of the stalk in itself. These are just more examples of lymph nodes and you can kind of scan through them and you can see um, the stalk in the middle. Here's more examples of some lymph nodes. And these are just enlarged lymph nodes. And then right in the middle, you'll see that stalk. You can actually put color flow on lymph nodes where the hilum is, and you'll see an increase in color flow of those lymph nodes as well. Seromas, on the other hand, usually occur after surgery or trauma. They're made out of serous fluid and re can refer to any clear potentiaceous fluid in the body. On ultrasound, you will have, again, anechoic fluid collections. And then as they mature, you can have these nodular margins, something like this, where it's not clearly an abscess, but it starts developing these like clear margins. And then sometimes you will have increased vascularity. So if you put color flow on it, you'll have increased flow. When we talk about infections, necrotizing fasciitis is the one that we never want to miss. And ultrasound is one of my favorite things to use to help diagnose necrotizing fasciitis. So what you'll see on ultrasound is subcutaneous tissue thickening, subcutaneous air, and fascial fluid collections. So if we looked at our normal um, and we compared it to abnormal, <clears throat> you can see that this subcutaneous tissue is quite thick. It's very different than the normal tissue contour of soft tissues. Here's some more examples of tissue thickening. You see how it's nice and large. Normal subcutaneous tissue shouldn't be this thick. Here's another example. And a lot of times you'll see this subcutaneous air. So subcutaneous air on ultrasound is hyperacolic, bright white, and it's called like dirty shadowing. You should never see air deep within the fascial layers unless you're concerned for the necrotizing fasciitis. So these pockets of white is free air or sometimes referred to as dirty shadowing. Here's another example. You can see this bright white is the air or hyperacolic. Here's another example of sub sub subcutaneous air. And here's some more subcutaneous air. Again, you see how thick that fascia is and you see those pockets of white or dirty shadowing. Here's some more examples. And then you'll also see fascial fluid collection. So you shouldn't really see fluid deep within the fascial layers unless you're concerned for necrotizing fasciitis. So here again, you see this thickened fascia, and then you see fluid deep within the fascia layers, as well as some dirty shadowing. Here's some more examples of uh, fascial fluid collections. And again, another example of fascial fluid collections. So again, you see the fascia is thick, you see fluid deep within the fascia layers, and so on. So at this point, I want to actually notate that Sano saves lives. We had uh, a patient recently who came in with just some clinical signs of cellulitis, 
But we went ahead and put a probe on the patient. And what we saw is the patient actually had Fournier's gangrene. And you can see all those pockets of dirty shadowing, which is all free air. You can see how the fascial thickness is much larger and some fluid deep within the fascial layers. Foreign bodies are a lot of fun to diagnose on ultrasound. They tend to be hyperechoic to their surrounding structures. You can look for objects such as wood and glass. Um, they'll sometimes cause this shadowing deep to the actual foreign body. And then metal objects, on the other hand, actually cause reverberation or comet tail artifacts. So this is an example of a wood splinter form body. So initially you just see the shadowing from the wood splinter, but then right above where the arrow initially starts, you can actually see a piece of foreign body there. Um, this is one of our patients who had an um, ear foreign body where the earring was actually embedded into the earlobe. And we went ahead and did a quick ultrasound and you can go ahead and start seeing that metal is causing this reverberation artifact. And you can actually see how deep that foreign body is and how to use ultrasound to help you extract it. So again, metal causes this reverberation artifact or sometimes causes this comet tail artifact. This was a patient we had who had a foreign body um, in his arm. He had actually accidentally stuck a nail into his arm. And this was his corresponding x-ray. So you can see the foreign body, but it's a little bit hard to determine without an ultrasound how deep it is and if we can actually remove it at the bedside. So what we did was we placed a probe right onto the patient and we looked for the foreign body. And so like we've mentioned, metal likes to cause this hyperechoic appearance. So you can see that the nail is kind of a little bit deeper than two centimeters. Here's just another example of that nail. And so what we did was we decided to remove a bedside. So this first video that I'm demonstrating is us injecting local anesthetic. And you can see the fluid spread from the local anesthetic. And then here we decide to actually use ultrasound to help remove that foreign body. And you can see we're kind of tugging along and removing that nail from this patient's arm. This was a patient who had a pencil tip um, stuck to their foot. And so initially when we looked at it in transverse, all we see is this tiny little dot. It's a little hard to see, but it's definitely there. You can see this bright white with a little bit of shadowing posterior to it. And then we decided to look um, at the same um, area in sagittal view, and you can kind of um, see it right over here. This is an example of a patient who had a glass form body to their foot. <clears throat> it's a little bit difficult to see in transverse. So for a lot of the MSKs and foreign bodies especially, I like to actually look at it in sagittal. And so right above this arrow, you see this bright white structure and that's the glass foreign body. This was a patient who had a toothpick um, to their foot. So you can kind of see it starts appearing right there and there's surrounding fluid around it. And then this is the entire um, toothpick in sagittal. So in sagittal, you kind of get the long view and you get to see it a little bit better. So in the ED, you know, we like to remove foreign bodies. So especially the foot, we have a great nerve block that we do to kind of anesthetize the area to remove the foreign body. And the nerve block that we usually use is the posterior tibial um, nerve. It's very easy um, to find you want to kind of locate the medial um, aspect of the foot right above the calcaneus. And what you'll initially find there is this honeycomb structure, which is your posterior tibial nerve, followed by your oh, posterior tibial 
um, artery and vein. So again, this hyperechoic structure is your posterior tibial nerve. And we inject anesthetic right to that nerve to anesthetize the sole of the foot. So this is just an example. So you can see all this black anechoic spread that's actually all the um, anesthetic surrounding this honeycomb structure, which is our posterior tibial nerve. Here's just some more examples of foreign bodies. <clears throat> so this was a fish hook um, that was embedded into a patient's thumb. Again, this bright hyperechoic area is the fish hook. And this is it in transverse. It's a little harder to see in transverse, but in sagittal, you're able to um, see it better. This was a nail form body in the hand, and you can actually make out the entire nail completely. That bright hyperechoic structure, that's the nail. And then when we measured it, it was about two centimeters. So again, we used ultrasound to help guide us um, in diagnosing it, as well as removing this form body. A lot of times we place uh, central lines in the emergency department for access, and we can make sure that after we've um, put our needle in, that our guide wire stays into the uh, vein that we want. So this is it in um, transverse, and then in sagittal, we can see the entire guide wire within the vein. This was um, a patient who came in um, with swelling to her buttock for a couple of months. Um, and what we ended up seeing was definitely a metallic structure because you kind of start seeing that reverberation artifact. And this is an example of a patient with a um, bullet still embedded with them. So moving on, um, ultrasound is great to diagnose fractures and dislocations, um, and especially using it for pulse reduction if you're not sure if you placed it, um, if your reduction is complete or not, rather than waiting for x-ray, you can quickly simply place a probe onto the patient and see if the bones align or not. So on x-ray, this patient had a Collies fracture, which is like a distal radius. And you can see here, that this is your distal radius and right there is the separation. Very useful to diagnose fractures and dislocations. Here's just another example, um, same patient. So you can see that this is the radius and then here's the dislocation. Here's just another example. So here you can see bones appear hyperechoic and then you see the separation between the bones and you can actually measure how uh, displaced it is. And so when we did measure it, it was about nine millimeters displaced. So we went ahead and actually did something called the hematoma block where we injected anesthetic right into the area um, that um, was broken and dislocated. And we used ultrasound guidance right into the area, injected uh, local anesthetic, and went ahead and completed our reduction. And so when we completed our reduction, we did a pulse reduction um, ultrasound, and you can see everything is beautifully aligned. Here's just some more examples <clears throat> of some form of uh, fractures that you can see on x-ray well, but ultrasound is just going to give you this uh, better picture. So you can see that here, there's a eight millimeter displacement. And again, we went ahead and did a um, hematoma block into this area. And then we did a pulse reduction ultrasound. And you can see again, everything is perfectly aligned. When we talk about fractures, one of my favorite ultrasounds to do is actually looking for fat pads. So on um, x-ray, to have a posterior fat pad that's elevated, you need about 10 mLs of hematoma. On ultrasound, you only need two mLs to have a positive fat pad. So it's very easy um, to do. In adults, if you have a positive fat pad on ultrasound, you likely have a radial head fracture. And in kids, it's supracondylar. So 
to do the ultrasound, you're going to, in, in uh, sagittal or long axis, you're going to place the probe right above the elbow. And then in short axis or in transverse, again, um, you're going to place it above the elbow. So normally, <clears throat> you uh, will see your distal humerus, your olecranon fossa, your triceps tendon above, and right below your triceps tendon is a normal fat pad. You see how continuous it is with the distal humerus. It's not elevated. Everything kind of just looks in line. As opposed to an elevated fat pad, where now you can see that it's not in line with the distal humerus, and it's kind of going above. That's called a positive fat pad. Again, in kids, that's usually a supracondylar, and in adults, it's a radial head fracture. So again, here's an example on um, the left side of the screen in sagittal, a normal fat pad, and then in transverse, a um, normal fat pad. So again, sometimes it's very hard to diagnose these fractures on x-ray, and that's why we go to ultrasound to help us uh, make these diagnoses. So you can see in sagittal, this is your um, humerus, and this is your olecranon fossa, and then you can see this elevation of the fat pad. This is a huge fat pad. Very easy to do, uh, very informative, and it'll give you um, a quick and easy diagnosis bedside. Humerus fractures on x-rays you can see well, but on ultrasound you can see it even better. And again, I like to make sure that my patients in the ED um, leave the ED pain-free. So once I diagnose it on ultrasound, I'll go ahead and do a quick uh, hematoma block into the fracture. As you can see, our needle's going in um, and I'll anesthetize them there. And that way, you know, sending them home, I send them home pain-free. Similarly, here you can see a comminuted clavicular fracture, and this is what it looks like on ultrasound. So again, you can see how displaced and magnified it is on ultrasound as opposed to on x-ray. And then again, you can see multiple comminuted areas of that clavicle. <clears throat> And what we did was, again, we wanted to anesthetize this patient for their comfort. Um, and she actually did great. Um, this was a 92-year-old female who came in and broke her clavicle. After we anesthetized this area, she was able to lift her arm up, scratch her nose. Um, it was It's great. So you diagnose it, you fix it. Patients are happy. You're happy. Everyone's happy. You can use ultrasound to help you um, diagnose rib fractures as well. So this is a normal rib, and you can see we scan through the rib, and then right below the rib, you actually start seeing the pleural line. But you can see that there's no fractures. The rib looks nice um, um, without any um, underlying fractures, as opposed to this, where you can kind of see this discontinuity of the actual bone. So right over here, you can diagnose a rib fracture very easily. Here's another example. Uh, this is just a still image where again, you see the uh, rib and then you see this little break and that in itself is a, a rib fracture. So again, um, patients who have multiple rib fractures in the ED at least, we wanna make sure that their pain is well controlled and so we can do something called a serratus anterior plane block to anesthetize those ribs. And we place our probe around the fourth, fifth intercostal space midline, and we use an in-plane approach. So to find the serratus anterior uh, muscle, we're gonna go ahead and initially identify our latissimus dorsi. And then our serratus muscle lies right below the latissimus dorsi muscle. And below the latissimus dorsi, you actually see the rib. All we do is take our needle and we'll want to pierce through the fascial plane that separates the latissimus dorsi and the serratus. And then we go ahead and inject into that area. And then you'll eventually see all that anesthetic spread. Here's just another example of the serratus block. So you can see 
We've pierced through the latissimus dorsi right underneath the fascial plane that separates the latissimus dorsi and the serratus, and we start injecting our local anesthetic there. And when we're finished, you can see that entire spread of local anesthetic. We can use ultrasound to diagnose mandibular fractures. So just like any other uh, MSK bone ultrasound, right? Bones are hyperechoic. And you're just looking to see if there's a little break. And right over there, you can see that there's a little fracture right there in the mandible. Here's another example with the arrow. Again, you see how it's no longer continuous. You can see that little break there. And here's just another example. Shoulder complaints are um, <clears throat> very common, at least in the emergency department. A lot of patients come in with shoulder dislocations. And so ultrasound is a great uh, utility to help us diagnose it. So when we do a shoulder ultrasound, we're coming from the posterior aspect of the patient. So anything that's posterior on our screen is gonna be anatomically anterior. So when you are doing a shoulder ultrasound, you initially want to find your scapular spine and then your glenoid fossa and then the humeral head. So here's just an example of normal shoulder anatomy. So again, you have your scapular spine, you have your glenoid fossa and your humeral head. And normally, you know, once you have the patient internally and externally um, rotate, you can see everything is kind of all together. With a shoulder dislocations, depending on body habitus, sometimes you'll have to use a curvilinear probe. Sometimes you can use a linear probe. Here, we are using a curvilinear probe, but you can see that this is an anterior shoulder dislocation because you find your scapular spine, you find your glenoid fossa, and now your humeral head is posterior on your screen, making it anatomically anterior. This is another example of a anterior shoulder dislocation. So we start by looking for our scapular spine. We find our glenoid fossa. And then we start seeing right here that our humeral head is anterior, uh, posterior on our screen, making it an anterior shoulder dislocation. Here's just another example with a still image. So for this patient, we wanted to see what was gonna uh, look better. Uh, the curvilinear or the linear probes. So we kind of compared, but as you can see, you can see both of them very well. It's the same patient, same um, anterior shoulder dislocation. And so um, as the theme goes, we see it, we diagnose it, we treat it. Here we did an intraarticular block. So we went right into the area where the uh, dislocation was. We anesthetized the area. And then we went ahead and uh, performed the shoulder reduction and then quickly did a pulse reduction scan. And now you can see everything is perfectly aligned. Here's just another example of um, an intraarticular block. You can see the needle going in um, right above the humeral head. And then this was the pulse reduction ultrasound. So everything now is perfectly aligned. Anytime we look at fingers and toes, one of my favorite um, things to do is a water bath. So here, um, you simply place their hands or their toes into a basin fill, filled with water because ultrasound likes fluid. And the water um, is used as an acoustic medium to enhance your images instead of having to use tons and tons of gel. And what you see is everything just appears so beautiful, so bright, bones are bright white, um, and it just enhances your images so much more. This was a, a patient who was in a lot of pain um, and we used a water bath. And what you can actually see here is that fluid squirting out of his fingers is actually blood. He's actually oozing blood but he had no problem tolerating this because the uh, ultrasound probe wasn't on him. His hand was just submerged in water and we were able to see these beautiful images. So boxers fractures are fifth um, finger fractures where again, you can somewhat see it on x-ray, 
but ultrasound is just so much better. So all you are doing again is just placing them in a nice water bath. You find the normal bone and then you where this arrow is, you can see the discontinuity, which is the fracture there. And for boxers fractures, um, especially for pain or if they're um, <clears throat> dislocated, we wanna go ahead and um, reduce it. So all we do is actually find our ulnar nerve and we anesthetize our ulnar nerve where you can see again here, this is that honeycomb is our ulnar nerve, right next to it is the artery. And we just anesthetize the area to go ahead and help us um, with the reduction. This is a third finger fracture seen on x-ray, and then we compared it to ultrasound, and it's just so readily uh, easy to be seen. You can see that um, it, it, again, no longer has that nice, straight, um, hyperechoic bone, but you see the multiple fractures. And again, this is in sagittal, which is easier to see uh, for bones, but we definitely wanna look at it in transverse and you can see the fractures right here as well. You can use ultrasound to um, diagnose uh, tennis endivitis, look at tendons. Um, here you can see that this is the uh, metacarpal and this is the proximal phalanx and tendons on ultrasound have this again, fine fibular paintbrush appearance. This is normal tendon. When you have tennis tendinovitis, you'll start seeing anechoic fluid within the synovial sheet. Very easy to diagnose. So let's talk about effusions. <clears throat> A lot of times patients complain about pain in um, the posterior knee. And, you know, yes, you may want to rule out a DVT, but a lot of times they'll have Baker cysts. Baker cysts are very easy to diagnose. They have this talk bubble appearance. And then you can kind of see um, on each side, you'll see the semimembranosus tendon as well as the gastrocnemius. So here's another example of a Baker cyst uh, scanning. And here's another example. So again, just like this talk bubble appearance in the posterior aspect of the knee. When we're talking about the anterior aspect, right, we can look for um, effusions here. Um, effusions are fluid filled. So of course they're gonna be anechoic and you can measure the uh, amount of effusions. Luckily, uh, most of us have two of each uh, body part. So we can always look at the normal and compare it to the abnormal and see if there's a difference in both areas. When we look at the hip joint, right, you always want to make sure that the patient is lying supine and you kind of want to frog leg them. So you're going to have the leg in abduction and flexion as uh, much as tolerated to help enhance those small effusions. So initially, you want to look at the femoral head and then <clears throat> find the femoral neck. And, <clears throat> excuse me, you, here you see the acetabulum the femoral head and the femoral neck and the joint capsules just above the femoral neck. So here's another example. So here's your femoral head, here's your femoral neck, and then you're measuring the amount of fluid. So in adults, anything less than seven millimeters is normal. And in kids, anything less than five millimeters is normal. Here's another example of the uh, hip, and this is exactly where you'll be measuring. This is an example of a large hip effusion. So you can see it's about 1.7 centimeters. That's quite large. And <clears throat> here's just another uh, example of showing comparison, right? So again, although there are certain parameters for adults and children, you actually can look at both sides and compare because a difference of 1.5 to two millimeters in uh, children is concerning and a difference in one millimeter in adults is concerning. And then you can simply go ahead and place the needle into that area to aspirate if you are deciding to do an ultrasound guided hip uh, arthrocentesis.
we can use ultrasound to help us look for hip dislocations. So here's the acetabulum, here's the femoral head. This is the normal um, articulation. And when we scan, you can see everything is kind of in place. As opposed to a dislocated hip. So now you can see that um, you, you have a loss of this normal alignment between the femoral head and the uh, acetabulum, which confirms your dislocation, just as seen here. Moving down the lower extremity, we can diagnose ankle effusions. So you want to identify the tibialis uh, anterior tendon and the medial malleolus. So here's your tibia, here's your talus. If you were to have an effusion, it would be here, but we can see that there's no hypoechoic area indicating an effusion. As you would see here, you can see that the effusion is just above here. And as previously discussed, we can go ahead and um, aspirate that effusion if needed. We can do this out of plane or in plane. Tendon ruptures are great to diagnose with ultrasound as well. So if you're concerned for an Achilles tendon rupture, you're going to place your probe initially in sagittal because it's going to be easier to see. And you're going to identify the calcaneus, that bright hyperechoic structure because it's bone. And the Achilles tendon inserts right onto that calcaneus. And then you're just going to be scanning um, cephalad. And when you have an Achilles tendon rupture or any tendon rupture, you're going to see this break in the tendon and hematoma. So again, you can see it inserted onto the calcaneus. We scan upwards and right there, we start seeing this disconnect of the tendon, which is the hematoma and the rupture right there. Here's just another example. You can see all of that hematoma and we lose that perfect architecture of the tendon itself. Here's another example. You can see this great um, disruption of the tendon. And here you can see that the Achilles tendon is torn. Again, these are in sagittal. And then in transverse, you can see it as well. You can see all that hematoma uh, formation and the disruption of the actual Achilles tendon. Here's an example of how to perform a quad tendon. So you're going to um, find the quad tendon inserting onto the patella, and then you're going to be scanning, again, cephalad. And this is normal um, quad tendon. Again, it has that beautiful paint front appearance. As opposed to this, where you can see that it's pretty much disrupted, it loses that fine appearance and you can see all that hematoma um, and this uh, lots of fluid around that quads tendon. Here's just another example of that. And then one more example, you can actually see the fluid um, kind of squishing around that tendon and the disruption of the tendon. So I heard we had some pediatric people on today, so we can absolutely use ultrasound um, to diagnose pediatric skull fractures. One caveat to that I will say is please use warm gel. Those babies are moving and squirming and they're really not happy. So if you are going to be using ultrasound on peds patients, try to warm up the gel. So the pediatric skull anatomy is kind of complex and it's a little bit challenging. So, you know, I wouldn't say memorize where every suture line is, but be familiar that there are these suture lines. There's a various different ones. So what you can actually do is again, bones like the um, in the skull or anywhere else are hyperechoic. And you're just going to be following those bones, but be familiar where the suture lines are anatomically, because sometimes you'll see this little divot, which is not a fracture, but those are the suture lines. Now, if you're not sure, you can actually follow the suture line down and you'll be able to see the fontanelle or where the brain tissue is.
So you can see that this is a suture line and then we follow it down and we start seeing actual brain tissue. As opposed to skull fractures where you can see this nice disconnect. And if we were to follow it down, we wouldn't completely um, see brain tissue. Rather, it's just a fractured skull. Here's another example of a skull fracture. And then sometimes you'll be able to <clears throat> see uh, hematomas. So you can see the bright white again is bone or skull. And then you start seeing fluid above it, which is just hematoma. In the ED, uh, we like to do a lot of different things. Um, and so you can actually use ultrasound to help um, you determine if you've intubated the patient successfully. So the trachea is hyperechoic. Um, it's uh, curvilinear and has this comet tail artifact. And then it, the esophagus is more distal. It's oval. It's hyperechoic with a small hypoechoic center. So again, this is your trachea. Posterior to that is your spine, uh, your esophagus. And above your esophagus, you have your thyroid gland. And just next to that, you have the carotid artery. So when you have a successful intubation, you'll see something called this bullet sign uh, because there's a slight increase in artifact and shadowing in the trachea. And then we call this the bullet sign. And we do not see the esophagus if you successfully intubated the trachea. So here's a video demonstrating um, a successful intubation. So you can see they're putting the ET tube and right there you have that bullet sign and you no longer see the esophagus. As opposed to this video, so you see something that looks like the trachea, but then it looks like you almost have two tracheas. This is called the double tract sign. This is a unsuccessful tracheal intubation, rather this is an esophageal intubation. Here's just another example of an esophageal intubation. So you can see the ET tube is within the esophagus. Now in the ED, um, a lot of things happen and we always wanna be prepared for worst case scenario. So say we've now intubated the esophagus and we can no longer um, intubate um, through to the trachea. So we are ready to do a cricothyrotomy. So we have a mantra in the ED, which is scalpel, finger, bougie. But then the fourth one is going to be ultrasound. So we can locate the cricothyroid membrane to help us perform a cricothyrotomy. So initially, you want to find the transverse thyroid cartilage, <clears throat> which is um, highlighted here in yellow. And posterior to that, you'll see the vocal cords. Then you're going to scan to find the cricoid cartilage, which is again highlighted here in orange. And the cricoid cartilage causes this reverberation artifact. And then you want to find that actual cricothyroid membrane. So here's your cricothyroid membrane. And then below that is your cricoid cartilage here with this reverberation artifact that look like A lines that um, cause that reverberation. In sagittal, <clears throat> you'll be able to see the tracheal rings, the cricoid cartilage, and the thyroid cartilage. Here's just another example of your tracheal rings, your cricoid cartilage, your thyroid cartilage, and right between the thyroid cartilage and your cricoid cartilage is your cricothyroid membrane. And this is where we're going to go ahead and make our incision again. Yeah, right in that sweet spot between the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage lies the cricothyroid membrane, kind of where those stars are uh, placed. And that's where we would go ahead and perform our incision for our cricothyroidotomy. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much uh, for this great presentation. Um, you can submit um, questions uh, for our presenter in the Q&A box. However, we also prepared a couple of um, quiz questions for you guys. And then after that, we'll move to the Q&A. 
Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch our first question and you should see it on the screen. Uh, let's test your knowledge. Um, um, so you should be able to see the question on the screen. Please um, choose the response. You think that is correct? Um, I'll give maybe um, 30 seconds, maybe up to 45 seconds for everyone to respond. And I see everyone is already responding. So anyway, um, we are at 40% of people who are still here. And so I give another maybe 20 seconds. Everyone is um, submitting comments. So thank you so much for your comments. And um, if you have questions, please submit them uh, to the Q&A box. All right, so um, I think I'm gonna end the poll right now and uh, let's see the results. Um, Dr. Rudnin, what do you think? A lot of people answered correctly, but there are some who answered incorrectly. So the question is, which is not an ultrasound finding of necrotizing fasciitis? And the correct answer is abscess formation. So you won't always see an abscess um, for necrotizing fasciitis because it's actually an infection of the deep subcutaneous tissue. So you'll see the fascial fluid, you'll see the subcutaneous air, and you'll see the thickening of the fascial planes, but you won't really see an abscess formation. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll move to the next question. Great. Which is not a part of the Massachusetts Abscess Clinical Decision to identify MRSA. So um, let's see. People already responding. So We'll give it another maybe 40 seconds. I see there are questions about uh, the recording. Um, so this presentation was recorded um, and you will receive an email uh, next week uh, with a recording. Also, this will be posted on our website. So don't worry, you can always go back and rewatch the presentation. All right, uh, we have about 50% of people who are here participated in poll. So maybe another 10 seconds if anyone wants to submit the answer. Right, let's see the results. Okay. Most of you. Good. So everyone was mostly listening. Um, so the Massachusetts abscess clinical decision um, to identify MRSA. So MRSA abscesses have a lack of well-defined edges. They're small volume, so they're actually small. And they have irregular or indistinct shapes. Great. Perfect. All right. And we have one more question. For the quiz, um, elevated posterior fat pads are seen in which of the following? Um, so you have four um, answers. Please choose one. This one is going fast. This one might be going fast since I've mentioned how much I love doing this ultrasound. So thank you everyone for listening. Yes, thank you so much, everyone, and especially people who are joining us from the other side of the world, where it's probably 1, 2 a.m. at night. <laughs> thank you for staying so late, and, and or whoever, if you're joining early in the morning, we understand how busy things can get, so we really appreciate it. So um, let's see. Um, I think everyone is... I know, slow down. So I will share the results. Let's see. 
Perfect. So an elevated posterior fat pad are seen in which of the following? So out of these choices, it's supracondylar, but in adults, it's also seen in radial head fractures. Very good, very good. Thank you so much. I do. I'm going to launch one more poll for you guys. So um, you can just um, answer it before you leave. And uh, we're going to move to our Q&A. We still have a little bit of time. So 10 minutes. Um, so the first question um, is, if you're not reducing the fracture and inject lidocaine for local anesthesia versus oral medication, are you concerned with introducing in infection to the area? Do the benefits outweigh the risk? So that's a great question. Um, even if I'm not reducing the fracture, I we try to clean every area as sterile as possible. And I will go ahead and inject um, lidocaine, especially if oral uh, medications do not help. A lot of times with these comminuted fractures, these patients um, are in significant pain. And a lot of times giving elderly patients opioids, you know, has more harm than good. And so what I've seen in practice is if I do uh, inject a little bit of lidocaine, they're going to just feel so much better. So I would say um, the benefits outweigh the risk. Thank you. All right, next question. You ever Im uh, image salivary glands product obstructions? I've noticed a few upticks in those within the past year or so. Um, <clears throat> I haven't personally, um, maybe um, once or twice, but I, you know, kind of make it more of a clinical diagnosis, but it's a great application to use. I would say, um, you know, try to get a little bit more familiar with it. And I think it's something very useful. Okay. Hey. Next question is, excellent presentation. Can you please share how you visualize the needle so clear? Okay. So to visualize the needle um, throughout, you actually want to make sure that the needle um, is placed in plane. So if this is your ultrasound probe, you want to place it right here. And so that way you'll be able to see the entire needle as opposed to the needle tip when you place it out of plane. Um, and then you want to fan a little bit so that you're able to see the entire needle because needles are metal and it's very easily seen on ultrasound. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, uh, next question is, we see subcutaneous edema above. Uh, okay. Here's no. where my <laughs> uh, clinical knowledge stops. So if you want to read this question, Dr. Edmund. Sure. We see subcutaneous edema above the malleolus frequently. How do you differentiate it from cellulitis? Great question. So first off, I would say always compare both sides. Anatomically, we have um, two of each body part. So always compare to the other side. Now you can see uh, edema, but it's not always cellulitis. So it has a little bit more of that um, cobblestoning appearance if it's cellulitis. And then I would actually say even scan upwards till you see the normal tissue and compare it from the normal versus abnormal, as well as there's a little bit of, you know, how the patient looks itself, right? Are they actually erythematous on exam or not? So you're going to have to clinically correlate as well. But I would say always compare to the normal side. Perfect. Thank you. Um, next question is from Jonathan, um, differentiating muscle tear versus just hematoma. So you can have some hematoma formation. You, you can have both. You can have hematoma and a muscle tear, but you're going to actually have to look at the entire muscle in itself and see if there's any like disconnect. And with at least tendon ruptures, you can see that there's a complete disconnect. And in that disconnect, a hematoma formation uh, appears. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, next question is from Nicole. Uh, when are you reducing a dislocation and you perform an intra-articular block? Are you still providing POIV pain medication? Um, so what happens is a lot of times these patients 
come in um, and they'll get a dose of PO medication, some ibuprofen. And by the time it's diagnosed, they have a little bit of ibuprofen. If I'm going to go ahead and perform a reduction, I simply um, use enough anesthetic to do so. Um, <clears throat> say uh, for these um, Kali's fractures, distal radius fractures, a, a hematoma block into that area is definitely sufficient. We've also been using a lot of other um, nerve blocks. So if it's for upper extremity, we can do uh, interscaling blocks. We can go ahead and do raptor blocks. Um, we've done, uh, for hip dislocations, we've done uh, pang blocks, pericapsular nerve group blocks. So typically um, just those anesthetics is usually more than enough. Thank you so much. Um, next question is from Garrett. Any utility in the diagnosis and management of various hernias with POCUS? Absolutely. That's a great question. So if you have a hernia, um, say an abdominal hernia, and you uh, want to reduce it, you can actually use ultrasound to help guide your reduction as you'll be able to reduce the hernia, as you can actually see going back um, in the correct place. So absolutely. Thank you. Uh, next question is, what is the place of ultrasound on meniscus tear? So I haven't really been using it, um, you know, uh, for meniscus tears. You know, I think the better test for that really would be an MRI. Um, I just personally haven't uh, used it on meniscus tears. Thank you. How to differentiate necrotic lymph nodes from abscesses? Good question. So remember, abscesses have this kind of the squish test you can use. Um, so they'll be able to kind of um, change shape as you press down onto them, as opposed to lymph nodes won't have this uh, positive squish test that we call. And they will have this um, areas that you will still be able to see the stalk from the hilum. Great, thank you so much. Um, a question from Garrett. Uh, do you have a favorite POCUS resource online or otherwise? POCUS Academy. <laughs> great question. Thank you. Yes, we do have a great resource library with lots of uh, webinars, infographics, cases, knowledge checks. So, and it's free. So free of charge. Um, you don't have to register for anything. So just please visit our website. And thank you so much, Dr. Rudman, for featuring it. Um, so next question is, um, uh, let's see, needles are sometimes tough to find out, even if in plain for beginner, mostly due to machine setup difficulties. Do you have any suggestions? So some machines have a needle function that you can use that enhance the brightness of the actual needle. Um, so if your machine has that, you can try to use that. Otherwise, I would just say try to fan until you completely are able to see that entire needle. Uh, all right. Lots of questions coming in. So let's see. I think we have two minutes. So from the ED standpoint, do you find it beneficial to perform ultrasound of the lower extremity to rule out DVT? Or do you go ahead and send out for official ultrasound for the sake of time? So uh, DVT ultrasounds are definitely one of my uh, favorite ultrasounds to do as well. They're fairly easy to do. Once you're familiar with the anatomy, it's quite uh, simple to do. And we teach our residents this all the time. So a bedside ultrasound should be more than sufficient. Now, of course, it's a little bit harder to see um, veins in the in the calf. Um, so if you have a you know high clinical suspicion and it's negative, you can always ask the patients to come back and return if you know the symptoms aren't improving or not. But we teach um, the, our residents and we perform bedside um, duplexes all the time. Great, thank you. Uh, how to see fluid turbicity in effusions? I'm not completely understanding the question. Fluid. 
Mohammed, do you wanna maybe include a note? Uh, we'll come back to your question. Um, okay, next question is how to improve veins visualization for IV line and uh, midline? Okay, great question. Um, I, I love anything procedural. So um, I always scan the vein like 10 times at least so that I only have to stick them once. So try to find a vein that's kind of away from everything else if you have that uh, opportunity. And then scan up and down and make sure that your ultrasound is actually, as you're moving it, it still stays in the middle of your screen. And then one tip I will tell uh, everyone is if you're going out of plane, you're going like this, never have the needle next to the probe, rather come back at least a centimeter and go at a little bit of a steeper angle. And then once you're in the vessel, drop your angle. And so we kind of call this the big dot, little dot. So if your vein is the big dot, your needle is the little dot. And once you see the needle inside of the vein, you move your probe away until you no longer see it. And then you push your needle forward and you do this the entire length so that you know that your catheter stays inside the vein the entire way. Great tips, thank you so much. Um, so the next question is, um, does cellulitis always depict cobblestone appearance? Good question. So in early cellulitis, it doesn't always have that cobblestoning appearance, but rather it loses the perfect echo texture. So initially you start seeing changes in the epidermis and the dermis, and then it will develop into the cobblestoning. So that's why I kind of always look at the normal skin and then I kind of start tracking it to the abnormal. Thank you. And I think Mohammed uh, added um, a note about different be difference between clear versus turbid fluid effusion. So ultrasound isn't great for that. Um, <clears throat> what I would say is ultrasound tells you if there's fluid, if there's not, if there's, you know, turbid fluid, you can't really tell on ultrasound because it just tells you what type of fluid. It can't tell you the, uh, it, it can tell you which fluid rather what, instead of what type of fluid. And so if you're really concerned, um, then you might have to aspirate the fluid to kind of determine, um, what kind of fluid it is. Okay, thank you. I think the last question we're going to take, I saw it on the side chat about ultrasound devices. Um, do you have for uh, for urgent care um, site? Do you have any uh, brand names or uh, machines that you like? Um, so I we we use the GE, um, the venue and the fit. We also have a mind ray. It depends on, you know, your, how big of an area you have, right? So the GE venue is a little bit small, the fit rather is a little bit smaller. So it's kind of like a tablet. So it's probably easier. The genu uh, venue um, is larger. It's kind of like this. Um, so in smaller places, I would say, you know, um, going for something a little bit more portable might be a better use. Yes, and I also wanted to mention we also have this resource on the website if you want to browse different companies and different machines. Uh, we have um, on our website a list of devices if you want to browse to, in one place, so you don't have to Google every single one of them. Uh, but we're at time. Uh, again, thank you so much, Dr. Rudnin, for a great presentation. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Um, uh, this webinar was recorded. I'm going to repeat myself. So you'll receive a link um, uh, within a week. And I also wanted to mention that uh, we will be having a Cyber Monday event in a couple of weeks where you can purchase our certificates and certifications at 50% off. So if you're interested in certification, just let us know um, and you also receive some additional communication. Thank you so much. I will see you next month. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Daria, for having me. It was a pleasure being on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you.